diamonds. I know. <laughs> we got diamonds. Did you guys get diamonds? Does anybody want diamonds? Look under your chair. You get a diamond. You get a diamond. You get a, you get a diamond. diamond. Um, thank you guys for being here. It's been a great day of content. Um, and thank Chamath here. I've had the fortunate opportunity to interview Chamath on many occasions. We've had a lot of private conversations over the course of the last, I think, five years or so. It's been um, crazy time for investors, for entrepreneurs. You know, you as a former operator, I think you have a lot of opinions how businesses should be built and operated and all that sort of stuff. But then as an investor, you've had some crazy returns too, right? Um, so thank you for being here to this audience here. And, um, you know, speaking to this audience, I think is really important, right? Because it's like allocators, you got all that dough, and then you got to find the right people <laughs> to invest it. So, um, Chamath, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much, man. Thanks, Dan. Um, let's talk about the macro. You know, I, I feel like um, there are very few people that I know. So, I've been doing CBC for a long time. I've been an investor myself. I'm just kind of the sole operator now. But a guy and I who was just up here, we run a little bit of a media company here. You know, there's very few people that I come across that have. I, I think the the um, I don't know, man, the knowledge of both the public and the private markets, the way you do, the finger on the pulse. You know, you've had some videos, some interviews on CNBC with our friend Scott Wapner that have gone absolutely viral. Talk about, you know, public markets. Talk to us, what's going on right now? Because it feels like we are in a little bit of a exuberant period in the public markets. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we're dealing with two things. One is just that if you really think about it, if, if I had said, 13 months ago that we would be sitting here today and the Fed would have hiked you know, 500 basis points in nine months, plus or minus, you would have thought it was crazy. So we're sort of like coming into this phase of sobriety trying to figure out how do we all do our jobs differently and what does it mean for the investments that we've already put in the ground? And for me personally, I think it really, the setup is that it amplifies tail risk. And so right now, I'm sort of somewhat quite cautious because I think there's a left tail risk, and I think Mike Wilson is here, but you know, if you listen to Mike, who's been really right so far, you know, the risk is that the S&P earnings are sort of with a one handle, 180, 185, and all of a sudden the S&P is you know, 3,200, 3,300. But then there's this right tail risk, which is that the Fed becomes dovish Everybody capitulates because it looks like things are slowing down. And now all of a sudden, though, you will have to deal with terminal rates that are going to be 4 to 5% on a more consistent basis because if he lets off the gas now, then inflation kind of sticks around. Yeah. So both roads lead to repriced assets just in very different paths dependency. And those risks to me are a little um, heightened. And so I've tried to kind of be quite conservative and just you know, be down the fairway. Now, one who has capital to invest can be conservative if they want when you look at where the two-year treasury note is right yeah. now, right? And so I, I, I think it's kind of interesting for the first time in a long time, there is an alternative you know, to, to, to equities, for instance. And so talk to me a little bit about that barbell because I think the biggest risk right now is not that the market or investors come around to the fact that maybe Mike Wilson's right and maybe that S&P earnings are gonna be down 10% this year to $180 and therefore there needs to be a lower S&P 500. I think the risk is that for whatever reason, um, you know, we just reignite the risk asset bubble right here because if we don't learn anything from the period that we were just in, and you've written about this, we're gonna hit this sub stack that you wrote last week here. Um, if we don't have a reset, it just sets us up for the same sort of mistakes that we make again and again. There's a lot to learn when you look at the past, which is that a high rate environment, at least in the area in which I operate, which is, you know, um, technology businesses, we've actually counterintuitively built better businesses during periods of high rates. Yeah. And the reason is because there are fewer allocators that come to our part of the market because you can find better risk-free rates, as you said, the two-year, you know, even down to T-bills and repo, quite honestly. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is that in the absence of this surfeit of capital, it forces each individual company to frankly just be better managed because there's less money. And so we become as an ecosystem more intolerant of excess. And all of that just creates better run businesses. And so we haven't had that cycle for probably 14 or 15 years. Um, and so we 
desperately need it. Because if you look inside of a lot of technology companies, they're unfortunately rotting from the inside out. Right? They've had a period where they've been able to raise successive amounts of capital to fund a valuation creep that frankly won't translate it into what the actual money is you're going to get back. Um, in our industry, you know, there's a couple of dirty little secrets or like the dirty soft underbelly. One of them is that only 10% of all of the firms in our asset class actually generate real returns, 10% which means 90% are basically floundering around burning money. The other thing is, is that we have always consistently generated a high single digit DPI. So like 1.7x is like the 30 year average on distributions. Yet we are the worst offender when it comes to showing people like you guys, paper markups or TVPI. So there is this dance that, that this industry has been able to play because rates have been at zero. So as investors, the asset class, I think, is very challenged in order to generate real returns now. The companies that we funded have, as a result of all this excess capital, been more poorly run than otherwise. And so we need to course correct. So we need these rates to be sustained for you know, five, six, seven years, frankly, hopefully in order to really flush it through the system. What did you see, you know, back in 2018, it was Fed Chair Powell's first year there, and he started raising interest rates right off that zero interest rate bound that had been there since the financial crisis. And they were kind of, I think they used the term on autopilot raising like 25 basis point every other meeting. They got to, I think, three and a quarter percent. And remember what happened in Q4 of 2018, yeah. the S&P 500 went down 20% in a straight line and then they pivoted, okay? Exactly. And I think, so talk to me about like, what were you seeing in the private markets then and how did that rate increase in the pace of which was much steadier, you know what I mean? It was not the, 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 the way that they went up this year. I'm like, what, what were the impacts on, on venture back then? There was none. Um, and the reason is that at, in that time, the, the narrative was that China was turning over. Mm -hmm. And so people needed to reestablish some amount of baseline global growth. And so they thought if China turns over and the US now all of a sudden raises too much, we're gonna be in a lot of headwinds. And so Powell capitulated, but it turned out that China actually faded that perceived theoretical recession risk. And so all of a sudden the floodgates opened because rates were low here. You couldn't find any real growth anywhere. And we were at that period of the market where so many people had been sitting on the sidelines and effectively on the outside looking in, that they ran into the riskiest assets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, technology ripped, crypto ripped, SPACs ripped. Everything that was on the far edges of the risk curve were really well bid to a point that now looking back clearly was unsustainable. But it's explainable in the sense that we gave folks um, no real other recourse because they were in the eighth or ninth year of no returns anywhere else. Yeah. Do you, do you think as investors, we just kept on looking for new things to invest in? So you just mentioned SPACs. Obviously, you were a prominent player in that. And you know, when I first met you, it's not like you were some Johnny come lately. I mean, you were bringing a company SPAC, uh, Virgin Galactic, right, in 2017. And so um, talk to me a little bit about that because there was also obviously crypto. There was, un you know, Snap went public in 2017. It was wildly unprofitable then, it's still unprofitable now, all these years later. What's the post-mortem on some of these things? And obviously crypto had this huge retail move um, you know, that started, obviously it crashed in 2018, but started to reflate in, in 2020. What, what, what's your like look back on, on yeah. those risk assets right now and, and what survives out of that? So you know, we, in our history from founding, we've had these things where we've had these major themes that we've always invested in which is early stage venture, largely in healthcare and software and deep tech. Um, and so that's been a consistent theme and recently energy transition. That's been our bread and butter. But every few years, it, it has turned out that we sometimes go a little off piste. And you know, in the early you know, 2011, I went off piste and I made a huge bet in Bitcoin when it was 80 bucks a coin. It just seemed like just an unbelievably massive risk reward. We did the same thing in the mid-2000s. We did it in SaaS. Um, we did it in deep tech. And SPACs, you know, we stumbled into this thing because we wanted to raise money 
for a bunch of our companies that were extremely capital intensive. And we demonstrated something that in a moment just caught a lot of wind. So yeah, as you mentioned, you know, we did six of them. I think there were 650 of them just in 2021. So we're you know, about 1% of the market. You know, I think we bought good companies well. I think we sold well, quite honestly. But it's one of these things where it was fueled by a moment in time of just enormous excess liquidity. And now I think we're sort of back to basics. So for us as an institution, we're kind of back to early stage venture. Who knows, we may go off piece at some point to really try to ton it. That's our job as investors, right? Is like, we allocate risk well, we maintain top quartile returns, but when there's a window, you know, I have, you know, I'm the largest LP in my fund, so when there's a window, I go for it. And that was a moment where we tried to go for it. So as the largest LP in, in social, I mean, when you think about this refocus on early stage, talk to me about, is it, is it just the environment? Is it about some things that you've learned over the last few years? Is it where you think that you can have the most impact on these companies? And then to your point, if things get back rolling again in a couple of years, maybe that's when the, when the growth investing comes back a little bit. Yeah, I think the problem with growth investing, just to give you some anecdotal data, like at the end of last year, I looked at six, seven converts. And these were all extremely well-known companies that all of you would know on a first name basis. And they all came to me trying to raise convert. And I said, well, here's the real market clearing price of these companies. And none of them took my money. And instead they did a convert to basically deflect and kick the can down the road on valuation. So we're at that point in the market where all the boards of these private companies refuse to budge on valuation. And the reason is because it impacts meaningfully their DPI or their TVPIs that they've given to LPs. And so it's a very difficult part of the private markets right now to invest in because you will not be allowed to do true price discovery because nobody wants to take the real hits. The best companies will do it. I mean, I think you saw today that Stripe may take a 50% down round. That's probably the best technology company in Silicon Valley proper being built right now. So they'll do it. Klarna did it. In fact, it's so interesting that it's all, you know, the through line there is Sequoia, which is an extremely disciplined and incredible organization. So they're able to enforce that discipline. But other companies, other venture funds, they don't want to look at the TVPI decay. And so it's uninvestable, quite honestly. On the other end, early stage venture has always been where the real gross dollar profits are made. And if you overlay that with a rising rate environment and you regress that back 30 or 40 years, in fact, we did it looking back 60 years, the most incredible opportunities to make money are actually when rates are rising in early stage venture. That's just the historical artifact if you look at public companies in size. So you know, we said very explicitly, okay, no more growth. The default answer right now is going to be no. We're not going to touch it. But we're going to continue to sort of over-index into early stage and do as many good deals as we can see and you know, let the chips fall where they may. What do you think, you know, um, if you just think about um, public markets, for instance, you know, some of these you know, high valuation names without profits, um, they started correcting you know, early 2021, right? So by the time that the NASDAQ topped out in late 2021, the S&P topped out the first week of January in 2022, yeah. there, were, there, there were bear markets all over the place, right? Yeah. And so because a lot of people you know, were looking at the indices, they were masks, you know, some of the devastation, crypto had already turned over, that sort of thing. What do you think some of the signs of the bottom in, in private tech will be? Because to your point, if you're seeing some of the leadership, the stripes, take these big hits, there's got to be some devastation to happen on, under much smaller names that are out there at big valuations. I think when limited partners really become disciplined about keeping people honest about distributions, because in a moment like this, when your asset allocation goes upside down, the most important thing are who can generate DPI? Who actually gets money back into your pocket? Forget paper markups, because they're kind of not really worth the paper that they're printed on. Where are the distributions so that my, my actual assets can be more right-sized? They are the ones that I think start this trend of bottoming. Because what will happen is you'll go to the organizations that have had the most consistent TVPIs with the most inconsistent DPIs and say, I can't work with you anymore. 
because this is now just money bad. And when those folks leave the market, those companies now become more prone to get repriced accurately because that set of GPs will say, I need to return money. Mm -hmm. And that's where guys like us can step in with clean balance sheets and lots of money to go and say, okay, let's go and reprice these. I honestly think that's like three years away. Yeah. It, I thought it was gonna be three quarters away. You know, at first when we were thinking about like, how much capital are we really gonna be allocating over this next period? We cut it by two thirds mm -hmm. because we just didn't see the opportunities in the late stage anymore. But you're excited about some stuff. You tweeted this the other day, um, the two most important drivers of the next decade, the marginal cost of energy and the marginal cost of compute will both go to zero. And you said over the next decade. So this is at early stage, you're looking for opportunities to invest in and around these themes. Talk to us a little bit about that. These are multi-trillion dollar shifts in how the information economy and, and as a result, the economy itself is gonna work. You know, right now, today, you can generate, using solar and wind, energy that's effectively approaching zero. Mm -hmm. And it's cheaper than that gas. And not, it's not just at the residential level, but it's also at the baseload power generation level. And so as a totality, you have the ability for 100 million U.S. homeowners to effectively displace 1,700 utilities and all of that monopolistic behavior and regulatory capture. And so if all of a sudden you have free abundant energy that you can collect from the sky and store in your garage and direct anywhere you want, you all of a sudden have the ability to solve problems via brute force that before you couldn't because they were boundaries of energy. Separately, we have found a way to transition away Moore's law away from CPUs into these application-specific chipsets now that operate in a realm of machine learning and AI. And the cost of that is effectively going to zero because these reference designs now are so well understood. The software is so powerful now. And when you multiply these two things together, if you wanted to brute force, reverse engineer every single theoretical protein that binds to every other protein in your body, what was a multi-billion dollar compute and energy problem is now effectively a few tens of millions of dollars. If you actually wanted an infrastructure that could actually detect in real time how to give true autonomous self-driving, make extremely complicated decisions, and stop on a dime, those were compute problems that you can now basically make render costless. And so when those two things come together, it's one of these really transformational moments in our society where you can go after some very big problems that we didn't think were tractable before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very excited about that intersection and finding companies that play on those themes. How, how does um, this sort of economic, I was gonna say Cold War with China, but it seems pretty hot. How, how does that affect some of the ways you think about these transformative technologies? Because again, you know, I mean, you know, our government is banning advanced you know, technology sales to China. It just seems like we're gonna be in this bipolar tech world. It's and, and great it, for America. Does it? Okay, I wanna it's hear unbelievable, yeah. It's an unbelievable boon for America. And it's an unbelievable boon for America's technology sector. Yet, you know, the, the thing is, when you look inside of China, they are extremely good at process engineering. They're also extremely good at additive manufacturing. You know, they're extremely great in things like specialty chemicals. But all of those things, when you think about the precursors, come from American, European, Australian companies that now have a huge incentive to diversify that supply chain away from China. That benefits American companies in a massive way. And so China's response is muted. So for example, we said we are going to slow down the flow of extremely advanced semiconductor manufacturing equipment into China. China's response said we are not going to allow you guys to get the input components to uh, certain um, silicon wafers that are used in PV cells. I mean, if you had to rank these things, no offense, but we can make solar cells. <laughs> The equipment that you need to get to two nanometer scale in chip design comes from the Dutch, the Germans, and the Americans. And so it's a really interesting moment where this, you know, the game theory optimal view is that China's cost advantages actually get moved over, mm -hmm. right? So the margin decay in China gets replaced by margin expansion in these businesses here that now allow them to operate in parity. So it's a, I think it's a really, um, really unique moment. 
Do, do some of these geopolitical kind of issues, maybe call them disconnects, do they present unusual opportunities for somebody who's doing early stage investing? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you one thing that I can't totally talk about, but kind of can talk about, but like, you know, there's an extremely large government that we partnered with to create a, a specialty chemical that's used in the battery supply chain. And this is a, you know, 4951 joint venture between us and them where you know, they're giving us discounted pricing, we're building the entire supply chain, it benefits from the BIL and the IRA and the CHIPS Act in the United States. That deal would not have been possible three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. A, that an organization like ours would partner with the government. B, that that deal would be reliable. And these are the kinds of opportunities now that have been unleashed because people want to diversify away from the Chinese supply chain. I think China will do well, I think that they have an incredibly uh, vibrant internal ecosystem. But wherever sort of the G7 can put pressure on the criticality of these supply chains and diversify and force them through subsidies or other things to just be North America or you know, a different set of allies, it's going to create a lot of economic tailwinds for those people that play in that. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. I mean, this seems like everyone in this room is, you know, you've heard of this chat, GPT, and I know this is stuff that interests you, and you're probably the sort of guy who's been on top of this stuff for years, and it just kind of bubbles up for a lot of people like us. It seems like I haven't seen a technology that's kind of captivated the public, you know, in, in a while. Yeah. Talk to us a little about these large language models. I mean, you just talked a little bit about how transformative AI is gonna be in all these different industries. What about it from an investment standpoint? Because you and I were just chatting about this. You know, I saw a headline, a company, I've never heard of them, two guys leave Google, chapter, or, you know, chapter.ai, and they're looking to raise $250 million at a billion dollar valuation, you know, maybe. What have we learned here? Because that seems like a big round for something that is probably be a handful of engineers kind of banging away at a, at a chat bot right now. Um, you know, when I was at Facebook, my team and I were probably the first folks that really commercialized machine learning in the wild. You know, when our first versions of Newsfeed and some other technologies that you guys probably interact with every day um, essentially was about using machines to guess and to guess better and better over time. So that's basically what this is just on steroids. And you know, what ChatGPT shows you is just the amazing value in allowing computers to assist you in doing work. It's like a you know, calculator replacing the abacus, replacing a pen and paper. Um, what's important, though, is this Buffett quote. A um, friend of mine told me this yesterday, which I loved. He told this story about refrigeration, and the story he tells is that the people and the person that invented refrigeration made some money. But most of the money was made by Coca-Cola, who used refrigeration to build an empire. And I view these large language models as refrigeration. Will there be some money made in it? I think so. But the Coca-Cola has yet to be built. And those are the companies that are really going to monetize it. And in order to monetize it well, Here's a basic thing about machine learning that's worth knowing, which is if you take 1,000 of the same inputs and give it to Facebook and Microsoft and Google and Amazon, they'll all come up with the same machine learning model. But if you have one extra thing, one little ingredient that all of those other companies don't have, your output can be markedly different. Mm -hmm. It's like giving two great chefs three ingredients, but you give the third chef one extra one. That person has the ability to do something very special. So right now, we are in the world where everybody is crawling the open web. We're going to move to a world where, as everybody gets sophisticated enough, where when refrigeration is widely available, somebody's going to say, you know what? This site, I'm not going to allow anybody else to access. It's only me, only for my models. And those models will become better. And so we have to let that play out a little bit. And so it's going to be a little bit of a really interesting arms race. So the, the next wave of M&A for example, could be companies like Google and Microsoft and Facebook looking at these companies saying, can they be viable inputs to my large language models or to my other machine learning and AI models? So you could see M&A activity that drives that differentiation before anything else. So lots of really, so then as a result for guys like us, early stage investors, we may want to invest in companies that have zero viable public market potential whatsoever, but is building a data repository that's so unique that we know that it will feed one of these bigger companies and their efforts in AI. 
And that could very well justify making an investment that we would otherwise not make today, knowing what we know. And, and on that front, I mean, so regulatory really quickly, because we only have a couple minutes here. I mean, you know, it, you know, 10 years ago, uh, Facebook would just buy the next thing, right? They'd pay a billion dollars. You know, the fact that Microsoft made a billion dollar investment in open AI, you know, the, in a different regulatory environment, they might have just bought it. They couldn't buy open AI. But you know, does this also excite you about early stage tech investing in this environment? Does the regulatory environment actually help your cause to let some of these companies bubble up a bit further than they might if they were just kind of taken over by the incumbents? Yeah, I mean, I think the incumbents are gonna have to veer into adjacent M&A that it's non-obvious, mm -hmm. that will pass regulatory muster. And then separately, it'll allow people who build the Coca-Colas of the world who use refrigeration properly um, to actually emerge with a lot less threat where the cross bundling and the cross selling and upselling that the big tech companies use to basically eliminate a lot of competition um, will be very difficult. I mean, classic example, look at the emergence of Reels and what Reels has done, and maybe it's not as obvious to everybody here, to the enterprise value of TikTok. I mean, I think we've all thought that ByteDance was gonna be a two or $300 billion company. There's all this you know, value tied up in it. All these folks have these big stakes in it. But if you look at the growth of Reels, it's probably had the enterprise value of TikTok before the regulatory stuff has happened. So that kind of stuff, I think, um, allows when all the big folks are fighting amongst each other, yeah. it allows the little folks to kind of you know, hit the seam and actually build something. Yeah. All right, before we get out of here, a lot of you guys are probably all in podcast fans. You know that he has, uh, you know, the, the tendency for a little hot take. Give me something, man. I'm going on Fast Money in an hour here. What, what do you got? What, what's, what's a hot take to leave this audience with? Wow, what's a hot take? Well, you know, my, 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 my most interesting thing right now is I have looked at, and Mike Wilson inspired me to do this. I basically went back and I looked at Google's P&L. And just for you know, shits and giggles, I took all the TAC, the traffic acquisition costs that they pay, and I put it back into COGS and I capitalized it. And I'm like, what's the true PE if you did that? And then I did the same thing for Facebook. Because you, know, you hear this constant thing, which is like, oh, this thing trades at 20 times, it's so cheap. Oh, Facebook trades at you know, eight times, it's so cheap. And it turns out Facebook trades at 19 times and Google would trade at 31 times. And then all of a sudden it's not so cheap. So there is a hot take. There you go. Which is when you look at software businesses and you actually capitalize some of these costs and look at true EBITDA, true EBITDA, mm -hmm. they're not nearly as interesting on a implied yield basis as other You know, you sound like a good friend of mine, Jim Chanos, just so you know. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah. All right. Listen, on that note, thank you guys all for being here. Chama, thank you for thank being you. here. It was great, man. Thank you so much. <laughs>